Welcome. I hope you're having a great day so far. Timestamps are on screen and in the description below. Let's get started. Today, we're going to be looking at Perlin noise, which is a smooth gradient noise function used primarily in computer graphics to produce natural looking procedural content. Examples of applications include procedurally generated terrain, 3D clouds, natural animation such as leaves moving in the wind, and texture generation. Now, let's dive into the algorithm itself. How did we get to the beautifully structured noise shown here? Well, first we have to understand that Perlin noise is actually many layers of similar textures stacked on top of each other called octaves. The image you see here is actually 12 more basic images overlaid on top of each other. So let's look at one of those images. Okay, same question. How did we get here? Well, now I can actually answer that question. In order to generate the single octave of Perlin noise seen here, we will start with a grid, appropriately scaled to how much detail we want in this particular texture, or in other words, the frequency of the octave. A larger grid means a lower frequency and larger features. Similarly, a smaller grid means a higher frequency and smaller features. Now, let's start the process of going from this grid to Perlin noise. First, we're going to generate a random unit vector at each grid intersection point, shown here in blue. Unit vector just means length of one. The vectors are not to scale in this animation, but mathematically they all have a length of one. Looking a bit closer, let's generate the texture by sampling different points in this grid, usually once at each pixel. Not at the grid intersection points necessarily, but at each pixel in the resolution at which we are generating the texture based on this grid, which will make more sense soon. So let's pick a point to sample the color for, say here. We're now going to calculate a few distance vectors, which simply go from each corner of the current grid box to the point we chose. Next, for each pair of vectors in the corners, we're going to take something called the dot product of these two vectors. Explaining the dot product is out of the scope of this video, but all you need to know is that for our purposes, it measures the similarity between two vectors, and the formula is quite simple. Let's label the scalar value dot product we just calculated, and get rid of the random gradient lines. The final step to sampling the Perlin noise at this point is interpolation. Or in other words, we want to incorporate the values from all four corners based on how close we are to them. So in our example, the top left corner has the most influence because it is closest, and the other corners will have less, but still some influence. Now, we could use linear interpolation, where closer and farther points have a directly proportional influence based on their distance. But as it turns out, this results in a boxy and unappealing look to the noise. So instead, we will use cubic interpolation. It's important that the start and end points of the interpolation are the same as linear, for values 0 and 1, but it's a smooth curve in between. Here's the difference between the two. And that's it. Now just perform this sampling process as many times as we want for the desired texture resolution, and we're done. One octave of Perlin noise. Speaking of octaves, let's discuss in slightly more detail how the layering method works. Recall that the size of the grid we use dictates the frequency of the noise. When layering octaves, each time we double the frequency, which is essentially doubling the number of grid lines we use, and half the weight of that octave compared to the last one, then add it to the total for that pixel. That's it. Now we're done with the theoretical part, uh, leave a comment or contact me directly if you have any additional questions. Now, let's get started with the C++ implementation. For the noise algorithm, I'm going to use pure C++, and to display our result, I'm going to use SFML. You can use any method of your choice for the display part, but if you want to use my method, there's a link in the description for how to quickly and easily install SFML for Visual Studio. Let's get started then. First, we're going to create a function called Perlin. This will sample the value of the noise at the given x and y inputs. For our purposes, the grid intersection point will be integers, and any points between will be decimal valued, all represented as a float, of course. First, for the current point, we'll determine the nearest four grid points, and we'll do this by converting float x and float y to integers, as this will floor the value, essentially removing the decimal part. We can then add one to these values to get to the other side of the current grid box. Using combinations of these four values, we can access the coordinate pairs for all four sides of the box, or all four corners, that is. Next, we're going to determine the interpolation weights. These interpolation weights will decide how much influence each of the four corners has on the final result, as we discussed in the theory section. Since the grid intersection points are at integer positions, the distance between them is 1, and therefore to compute the horizontal and vertical interpolation weights, we can just take the distance of the sampling point to the first corner. Next, we'll create a function called dot grid gradient, which will take in two integer coordinates and two float coordinates. This function will determine the dot product between the distance vector and the random gradient at the specified point. First, we're going to need a 2D vector struct, so let's make that real quick, just like this. Next, we're going to need to generate the random gradient for that point, 
While we want it to be seemingly random, we also want all the random gradient values to be repeatable. So when we regenerate a texture, we get the same output each time for the same input parameters. To accomplish this, we'll use a hashing function that converts our x and y position into a float between 0 or and 2 pi, or 0 and 360 degrees. I'm not going to explain how this function works, since this is beyond the scope of this video, but all you need to know is that it's a hashing function, it is pseudo-random, nicely distributed, and deterministic. The code for this function is also in the description, individually, if you're following along with the code and don't want to copy these constants manually. With our pseudo-random vector generated, let's compute the distance vector for the current grid point. And then finally, we can compute the dot product between our two vectors, which is just the product of the x components plus the product of the y components. Before I can complete our Perlin sampling function, we also need to create an interpolation function. This function will return a float and take three floats in, which are the two values to interpolate between and the weight. The weight is a value between 0 and 1. We're simply going to return this formula here, which is the cubic interpolation method discussed earlier. Great. Let's now revisit our Perlin sampling function so we can compute the dot product at each corner and then interpolate them based on the weights we calculated earlier. First, we'll compute the dot grid gradients for the top two points in the grid square and interpolate based on the horizontal weight. Then we can do the same for the bottom two points, again interpolating by horizontal weight. Now we can finally interpolate these two values by vertical weight and we're done. We now have a complete function to sample Perlin noise at any point. However, we still need to do two things, which are actually sampling the noise and displaying it, as well as layering multiple octaves to get more detail. We'll do all this in our main function, and start by declaring our window size, initializing our SFML render window, see my SFML beginner tutorial if all this is confusing to you, and then creating our pixel array. Our pixel array needs to be large enough to accommodate red, green, blue, and alpha channels for each pixel, so width times height times 4, all uint 8s. Now, we're going to set the base frequency of our noise, which I'll do by setting grid size constant. Next, we're going to sample the noise at each pixel in our array. So let's set up those loops. Now, we'll calculate the correct starting index in the array for the current pixel based on the x and y position we're at. Now, we can create a loop for the number of octaves we want. I'll go with 12 here. And for each increasing index, we'll calculate the frequency and amplitude. We can do this in a few ways, but I'm going to initialize two variables and modify them each cycle. Now, we'll go ahead and actually sample the Perlin noise at the current coordinates and add each octave to the total for the current point. Let's add a bit of contrast by multiplying our noise by 1.2. Additionally, Perlin noise outputs typically are between 1 and negative 1, so we need to clip to these values to make sure no addition resulted in a value greater than or less than the boundaries. Finally, we need to convert our value from 1 to negative 1 into a value between 255 and 0 so we can actually set the color of the image. To do so, we'll use this formula here. And once that's done, we can set the red, green, and blue channels to the color determined. And always set the alpha channel to 255. Great. Now that we've generated our pixel array values, we need to actually display it somehow. To do so, we'll create an SF texture and SF sprite, and initialize the texture with a window size. Once that's done, we can update the texture with the pixel array, and finally update the sprite based on the texture. Now, we can add the boilerplate code for the window loop, and then in the rendering section, we can draw the sprite. That's it. Let's run the code and see the result. Wow, beautifully structured randomness. You'll notice it's a bit slow. This is due to various reasons, including the code being intended for clarity and not speed. But if you are looking for ways to make it faster, consider watching my C++ GPU acceleration video, which should be out within a week of this video being posted. As always, the final code is in the description in case you got lost along the way. Let me know what you think of the new video style in the comments below, and I hope you're having a great rest of your day. See ya.